Cheers, man. He didn't read his proper speaker notes down there. What it did say was, I also share my name with a serial killer. They spared me that one. If you Google me, the first thing you'll find is Harry Roberts brackets criminal. <laughs> Which is a pain in the ass when clients are like, oh, we've got a guy called Harry coming in next week. Let's see this Harry Roberts business. It's like, shit, he killed police officers in the 60s. <laughs> Today ain't about that. Today's about fast CSS and performance. So it's going to be a fairly whirlwind tour of um, just CSS, how it can make websites faster, how it could inadvertently make websites slower, how we can identify it, and how we can hopefully mitigate that. Uh, yeah, not going to bother with a long intro. I'm Harry. I'm a consultant performance engineer. I guess is what I'm calling myself this year. Um, I found that you just, whatever job title you give yourself, that's what people hire you to do. So I'd, ra I'd really recommend it. Uh, I help big companies, typically quite big companies, make bigger and, and faster websites. One of these companies in particular, the train line, uh, they published a case study not too long ago which stated if they could reduce latency by just 0.3 seconds, customers would spend an extra 8.1 million pounds every year. Now, I'm not going to be directly referencing this body of work. I, I helped them on this body of work, and it was tons of fun. The only reason I'm mentioning this is just to try and give you a basis of the kind of numbers we're talking about. Just try and picture a number as small as 300 milliseconds outputting a number as huge as 8.1 mil. So that's the kind of sort of level we're dealing with. Uh, yeah, anybody who is familiar with my work probably knows me from like the CSS space. Uh, the last couple of years, my focus has shifted way more towards performance, which has been very rewarding, very challenging. But CSS is my first love, right? So any, any kind of crossover we can get here is kind of my happy place. So that's what this talk's going to be about. And um, I guess, why does it even matter? Why do we even sort of care about CSS when we talk about performance? Well, unbeknown to many, CSS is actually an enormous performance bottleneck, huge performance bottleneck. Uh, HTTP archive claim, or state, I guess, that CSS is in the top three major contributing factors to slow rendering times, right? The bottleneck towards the first render. Uh, and that's because CSS makes up a large part of what is called the critical path. And this is a very kind of oversimplified diagram of what the critical path is. But in order to get this render tree built, the render tree is what we need before the browser can start putting pixels in front of a customer. Uh, the render tree is built by um, DOM and CSS OM, right? So the little known CSS OM is a mandatory part of this process. The server will send off some HTML, some CSS. Optionally, there could be some JavaScript that influences what the DOM or the CSS on look like. The CSS on the DOM then get transposed and made into the render tree. And it's not until this point that the browser is able to say, great, I know what the page looks like. I can start putting this pixel here. I can start putting this div over there. So it stands to reason that any hiccup, any bottleneck, any fault along this journey, this oversimplified journey, is going to impact how quickly we can get updates on the glass. So I'm going to look at a few things that would affect this, this sort of first render. Now, this is only a 30-minute talk, uh, so it means we can't, we're barely brushing the surface. So keep an eye on the slides, and I'll update like an extended version of the slides uh, at some point. But the first thing we'll look at is file size. Start nice and simple, because it stands to reason that a bigger file is going to take longer to download, right? It's going to delay downloads, therefore delaying the sort of start render of the page. But that's simple, right? That's quite clear. That's quite obvious. I reckon we should look at the hidden cost, right? There's a different cost that people don't often consider. Anybody got any idea how long it would take a Moto G4 to parse a one megabyte style sheet? I, I don't know why I asked that, like someone's going to have an answer. That would be very impressive. Um, it sounds like a bit of an outlandish question, but no, true story. I was working with a client who've got a very large um, sort of uh, WordPress install. And every single page, every single plugin, every single thing on that site is bundled up into a one megabyte style sheet. And to parse that one megabyte style sheet takes uh, a fifth of a second, right? 200 milliseconds just to read over that many lines of CSS. Not applying them, not doing any selector matching, not actually styling the page, just reading that much uh, CSS took 200 milliseconds. And to try and humanize and sort of contextualize this amount of time, Light could have traveled 60,000 kilometers in the time it took to parse this style sheet. That's three lengths of the Great Wall of China. Or, check this out, it's one lap of Saturn. Um, <laughs> confession, right? When I was putting this part of the talk together, I learned way more about how fast light is than how slow CSS is. So <laughs> take that with a pinch of salt. But in the time it took a Moto G4 just to parse that style sheet, uh, light did a lap of Saturn. Um, so yeah, keep your file sizes nice and small. A good way of not keeping a file nice and small is to utilize Base64. Um, 
Unfortunately, uh, a few years ago, we were told with the best of intention that maybe we should stop doing the top one and start doing the bottom one to preserve HTTP requests. In HTTP 1.1, we've got a limited number of requests we can make. They're valuable. So we were told, well, you know, let's stay off the kind of like connections and let's start embedding assets into the CSS just to keep connections free for potentially more important things. Um, this isn't the best idea. Uh, in fact, if we were to just simply base64 encode the render conference logo, uh, disclaimer, render conf don't do this. I put this slide together and I thought, this looks like I'm dissing render conf. Render don't do this. But if we were to base64 encode the render conf logo, this is how enormous the CSS would look. Um, we're just filling up these critical assets, this critical style sheet. We're filling it up with more and more bytes. And the bad news is these bytes used to be non-critical. Right? When we saw that render tree diagram, images weren't mentioned anywhere. Now, all of a sudden, we just loaded a bunch of images, non-critical bytes, into a critical asset. This is going to slow down that first render. So base64, despite the best of intentions, is widely regarded now as being an anti-pattern. It increases file size, which, of course, increases download time, increases parse time. But that increase completely lies on your critical path. Right? It doesn't make the images arrive sooner. It makes the CSS arrive slower. Right? Everything syncs to the lowest common denominator. I did quite an in-depth experiment uh, last year about this. Uh, I've already been laughed at, right? So I shared like a preview of these slides. And uh, we've got Nadi, who's like an award-winning data viz sort of person, I guess. Uh, took the piss out of me for my terrible graphs. The whole point is these graphs are meant to look pretty bad, because the whole point is the data is so like, there's a, such a variance that it's hard to even visualize how bad this stuff can be. But yeah, last year I did an experiment, and you're going to see some bad graphs. Um, I took um, base64 image and a normal image on desktop and on mobile. And I compared the image decode time, the start first paint time, uh, and the CSS parse time for each. On desktop, we can quite clearly see that yeah, the right hand side is bigger, right? So <laughs> vastly longer. The, the green is where we want to focus. The green's our point of interest here. It took way, way, way longer for a base64 encoded image to begin its first paint, because the browser has spent you know, way more time trying to just decode those bytes. So this slowed down the user's experience. The user was delayed seeing that first change purely because we'd started sticking non-critical bytes into our critical assets. An even worse graph is what it looks like on mobile. Pulling this bad data out into something a little more digestible, uh, on desktop, parsing a style sheet full of base64 was 10 times slower. On mobile, it was 32 times slower to parse a style sheet that was stuffed full of base64. First paint on desktop was over two times slower, but first paint on mobile was 10 times slower because we'd stuffed this style sheet full of base64 encoded images. Imagine waiting. Actually, the numbers that ended up being what I measured was uh, it was 700 milliseconds for first paint on desktop, seven seconds for first paint on mobile. Waiting seven seconds just to see the first change purely because of sticking all this stuff in base64. If you're interested in reading the actual case study, there's a way more data, way better presented uh, at that URL. Next one, at import. So who's used import before? And I mean, um, not SAS's import. I mean, the vanilla CSS at import. For stuff like this, I've used it for, I tend to use it, well, I've used it before for Google Fonts, keep everything nice and self-contained. Turns out not a great idea, because it creates these kind of long request chains. Uh, pulling out an actual example, um, you could sort of say, well, I'm going to cache different parts of my CSS differently in a bid for kind of better performance. I don't want to cache bust my grid system every time I update the color of a button. So with the best of intentions, we break our CSS apart. Uh, but if we start importing it this way, we're actually going to make performance quite substantially worse. There's a little saying in the performance world that a waterfall is worth a thousand words. So I guess this picture of a waterfall is worth a million. <laughs> lucky, lucky people. What we can see here is that by importing these style sheets using uh, an import, we've got this lone kind of orphan request here. Yeah, sure enough, we can grab style.css nice and quickly. And at this point, the browser's thinking, great, I've got the CSS file. I can start building the render tree. And it opens that CSS file. But no, unfortunately, it finds a series of app import directives, which just then send it off back over the network to go and fetch more and more style stuff. So it can't build the DOM uh, until it's finished all of that. This is a screenshot of a diagram from a client I was working with just last week. Uh, and the vertical green line here is start render. This is the point at which the first pixel on the screen changed. And uh, sure enough, they were grabbing all of their Google Fonts style sheets, 
uh, via an import directive or several import directives, which was further delaying that start render. Simply flattening this out uh, into several link rel equals style sheets improved performance by over half a second, right? That's an easy way to make 8.1 mil for someone. Uh, and that's because simply it's like this. This is the process we're forcing the browser to go through. Hey, go and grab style. And it comes back excited to start rendering. And then we have to send it off for a bunch more stuff. The problem, I guess, is that the CSS is coming from inside the CSS. Simple fix for this was just flattening this, um, this out into several sort of link rel equals style sheets, begin parallelizing that, that kind of th those kind of requests. Actually, what we did with this client is we ended up flattening this out into parallelized requests and asynchronously loading it, and we got start render down from 2.5 seconds to 0 0.5 seconds. But that was a little more involved than I can really go into during the talk. Things start to look like this on this particular test case. Everything's parallelized and more bad graphs. That delta there is 412 milliseconds. 0.3 is worth 8 mil. Imagine getting 412 just by flattening out some imports, right? This is the kind of stuff that we can sort of focus on when we talk about CSS performance. Um, I guess no talk would really be complete about CSS performance if we don't mention selector performance. Um, but massive, huge, immediate warning is that this is the last thing on your list of things to optimize for. Right? Don't rush back to the office and start making your selectors faster because it's already incredibly, incredibly fast. But I do find selector performance quite fascinating. Um, selectors have got like an inherent performance. Uh, some are just generally faster than others. Some are slower for whatever reason. And the way we combine and compose those selectors can also affect performance. The key thing to know when we talk about selector performance is that browsers read selectors from right to left. Who knew that? Yeah, about a third. Um, Browsers read selectors from right to left. We read this from left to right in the West, because that's what we do. Browsers do it the other way around. They start here. And there's a really, 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 really smart reason why they do this. And I'll explain it on the next slide, I think. Um, but this is called the key selector. The official name for the selector, just before the curly brace is called, uh, it's the key selector, for a number of reasons. This is the thing we're actually styling. This is the only thing we really care about here. Everything that precedes it is just conditions and caveats. It's basically if statements, if it's in this, if it's next to this. So the key selector is the thing we actually style, but the key selector also holds a lot of the key to whether that selector will be fast or slow. Now, the reason the browser starts on the right-hand side is so, like, when you, when you learn why, it's so simple that you're just like, oh, I want to meet whoever did that and just buy them a drink, because that is smart. And the reason is, if you want to style a selector, if you want to style maybe um, nav li a, for example, the browser wants to know, well, the a's of the subject. So I'm going to look through the DOM and just find all the a elements. And if I can't find any a elements, I don't need to do any of the rest of the selector. Or in another way, the way I kind of like to describe it, is when you're a kid, or still now, I'm not judging, when you're a kid and you play little puzzle games like this, the quickest way to solve this problem is just start at the piggy bank, right? Because you know, you've got a 33% chance of getting it right if you start on the left. You're a kid. You're busy. You've got things to do, right? You're going to start on the right-hand side at the pot of gold. This is exactly what the browser does. The browser starts by saying, does this DOM node even exist? Because if it doesn't, then I don't even need to bother with the rest of the selector. The browser starts by looking for that pot of gold, that piggy bank. If it finds it, it will then continue to do the selector matching further up the DOM tree. But if it doesn't even find the pot of gold, it knows there is no point doing anything else. That simple inversion in logic is a built-in browser optimization that I think is incredibly elegant. Um, so I don't have any hard and fast data on the actual numbers involved, because well, I'll explain why in a second. But things like classes, pretty fast. IDs that we shouldn't really use in CSS anyway, but IDs and classes, typically quite fast. Because when the browser reads the DOM, it tokenizes it, and it gets a list of all the classes and IDs. It can match those really quick. Comparatively, something like this is a little bit slower. Because remember, we start at the right-hand side. So the browser has to find every paragraph on the page, then ask every single paragraph, do you live anywhere inside a dot sidebar? So it has to look up the DOM tree indefinitely until it either cancels out at the top of the DOM, uh, the DOM tree, or it indeed does find a class of sidebar. Something like this, comparatively, is really expensive. And I'm keen to stress comparatively because you're still not going to notice the slowdown here. But the problem with this is that that will ask every single DOM node on your page, even your script tags, right? even your meta viewport tag, do you live anywhere inside something that has a class of icon? 
If you've got a particularly large DOM tree, sort of several thousand DOM nodes, that's a lot of overhead that's only going to match a very, very small subset of the DOM. However, conversely, uh, this is actually really fast. So I don't need to remember a few years ago when we started doing the whole global box sizing thing, people were panicking, like, you can't use the star selector, it's really slow. If you want to pick every single thing on a page, this is the quickest way to do it, right? Because it's literally what it does. So this, without qualification, is actually a pretty fast selector. OK, a little quiz. Which is faster? Hands up if you think the top selector would be the fastest. Hands up if you think the bottom selector would be fastest. Hands up if you're genuinely just not sure. <laughs> Hands up if you can't put your hands up. Uh, OK, well, uh, <laughs> cheers for the participation. Uh, it's the top one. The top one's faster. And the reason the top one is faster, uh, I, I live my life through contrived analogy, but the reason the top one's faster is it's using a child selector. We're only checking one level of the DOM. So the top one would be like saying, hey, Harry, is your dad called John? I can immediately answer that by saying, no, nope, he isn't, right? Because I know that that knowledge is very quick for me to grasp. The bottom one would be like saying, hey, Harry, were any of the male like people on your dad's side ever called John? It took me years to work. Well, actually, I'm British, so I guess statistically, probably yes. But knowing for definite would take months, right? Because I'd have to do my entire family tree. So accordingly, child selectors are faster than descendant selectors. Because, well, uh, yeah, sorry. Child selectors are faster than descendant selectors purely because we only need to check a smaller subset of the DOM. Cannot stress this enough. Don't rush to the office on Monday and rewrite your CSS to look like this. But those are the micro. Don't nod. <laughs> um, these are the micro optimizations that are available. Now, years ago, in Opera, anyone heard of Opera? That was low. <laughs> um, Opera, in their dev tooling, they had uh, Dragonfly, their kind of answer to Firebug. Um, it doesn't exist anymore because Opera is a Blink browser, but how sweet is this? They used to have a thing that would tell you how fast each CSS selector was. Even many years ago, we're talking at numbers like you know, 0.03 milliseconds, right? Not numbers that are worth optimizing. Who'd like to see this in Chrome? It's only four of you. Fine, I won't bother. <laughs> uh, well, the bad news is I can't anyway. It doesn't exist in Chrome. Um, this tooling doesn't currently exist in Blink. It doesn't exist in Chrome. But if you would like to see this information, uh, please just take a picture. I'm going to take a drink. I'm going to leave this on the screen for a little bit. Take a picture of this URL. This is a little Google product forum group discussion thing. Just pop in there and say, hey, look, I would like to see this also. There is active discussion trying to get this kind of information into DevTools. And like I say, it's not something we should be optimizing for, but it'd be really fascinating to see just what impact specific CSS selectors have on performance. So yeah, jump in there, and just all you need to do is say, hey, I would also like to see this in DevTools. Um, just to not leave you completely empty-handed, though, you can, we can roughly proxy this information in Chrome, very, very roughly. It turns out that roughly 50% of the time used to calculate the computer style for an element is uh, used to match selectors. What that means really is the recalc style event, roughly 50% of that is spent on selector matching. So this is the recalc style event for the initial render of my entire home page. And it turns out that sort of, well, 14 milliseconds, obviously divide that by two is seven milliseconds, is all it took to match every single CSS selector to, uh, to sort of render an entire page worth of content. This isn't stuff that's worth, op worth optimizing for. On the subject of things that aren't worth optimizing for, this is an interesting one. Um, alphabetic CSS. Turns out if you write your CSS alphabetically, uh, well, you're wrong. You shouldn't. But if you do, it is better for performance. Um, if selector performance isn't on your list of things, to, uh, is the last on your list of things to optimize, this one isn't even on that list. Right? <laughs> Please don't go and do this. But interestingly, uh, if you did have your CSS written in a sort of quasi-random order like this, um, if you were to switch this to being alphabetized, you're going to find that this will gzip better, right? Because gzip loves repetition, it loves consistency. Alphabetic declarations actually compress better than just random declarations, uh, but not by much. Another bad graph. Uh, <laughs> If I get out my microscope, I will find that that delta there is 3.2% smaller. So after gzip, alphabetized CSS is 3.2% smaller. Um, I'm going to give you a really quick, very, very, very sort of cheap and cheerful high-level high level overview of why this actually works. And it's basically gzip in general. Hopefully, that's large enough for people at the back. 
If we had a text file that contained AAA, BBB, CCC, if we wanted to store this more efficiently, yet also recover 100% of the data, we could just re-represent it as this, 3A, 3B, 3C. We can expand those multiplications. We can get the exact same data out of the, uh, the other end that we had before. Uh, but we can store it in fewer bytes. This is what gzip does. It looks for repetition, and it stores those as kind of compressed sort of like pointers and references back to the original. Now, that's what happens if you've got uniform data. If we had a, a random-ish file, uh, cbcaabbac, we could only really represent that like this, cbc2a2bac. We haven't saved any kind of space there. Can't stress enough, this is a very crude overview of demonstration of why this works. But gzip loves repetition. It loves kind of consistency. Uh, and that's kind of why this phenomenon happens. So it turns out alphabetizing your CSS will make your file sizes a little smaller. Fresh off the back of that little nugget then, this whole gzip thing, uh, mixin versus extend. It turns out your choice of mixin versus extend has an impact on how fast your website might be. Um, I've got very, 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 very strong opinions about extend. Uh, I'm not really a fan of it at all. Um, but I want to go through some fairly objective kind of like some numbers as to why perhaps extend might not be the best thing to do in terms of performance. Made a very kind of quick, crude demo for this talk. And what I've done is I've built the exact same features, um, but one I've used SAS as extend, and the other one I've used SAS as mixins. And before compilation, extend comes in at 20 lines, mixins come in at 24 lines. There's very little point really measuring lines of code in pre-compiled assets, but that's the kind of, they're similar-ish in size. Once I compile this out, extends actually drops to 18 lines of code, whereas mixins go up to 30 lines of code. That's actually quite a big delta. Mixins create bigger file sizes because they create a lot of repetition. They just, they just create bigger files. As we discussed earlier, big files are bad for performance because it takes longer to download them. However, when we introduce gzip into the mix, and we know that gzip really likes repetition, we get this interesting phenomenon where we look at how much repetition we've got. With extends, we repeat a couple of selectors twice. With mixins, we repeat a bunch of declarations a lot of times. So with this very, 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 very simple demo, we can look at our compression delta. And the compression delta is the amount of compression we achieve. Turns out that mixins compress 23% better than extends, purely because of that extra repetition. That extra redundancy allows GZIP to be way more effective. So I guess the hot take here is that mixins are better for performance than extenders. Now this is unfortunately a very, very non-scientific demo. It was literally just those kind of 30 lines of code. So what I did is I went off and got a, um, a real project, an actual project that exists. I converted it all over to extends, measured the file size, gzipped it, et cetera, converted it all over to mixins, did the same thing, and another bad graph. Uh, mixins on disk were far larger. On disk, mixins, the green, 108 kilobytes on disk. That's how big the style sheet was. Um, whereas extends by comparison was 78, uh, sorry, 72 kilobytes. That's the size on disk. However, as soon as I gzipped these two files, the kind of inverse became true. The, the kind of the tables turned. Um, 12 kilobytes after gzip for the mixins file, whereas 18 kilobytes after gzip for the um, the extends, the mixins file compressed way, 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 way better. And this is completely circumstantial, but if anyone's familiar with the kind of magic 14 kilobyte cutoff point for a brand new TCB connection, we've just managed to sneak under that 14 kilobytes by using mixins. Uh, don't read too much into that, but if you're familiar with that 14 kilobyte cutoff point, we've managed to sneak into one round trip of latency to transfer 100% of this data on a brand new TCB connection just by choosing mixins over extend. Um, yeah, so blah, 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 it's quite tasteless to quote oneself in a slide, but I've done it. Um, if you're interested in reading the article, it's, it's there. You can grab it. Uh, I'm five minutes. Jeez. Um, asset domains. This is probably the most contentious uh, and least tested point of my talk. But I found out something really interesting. A few years ago, I used to work for Sky. And we were building skybet.com. Still paying off quite a lot of moral debt for that one. But um, we were building skybat.com, very fast iterative sprints. We were just building, building, building. And this was pre-H2 days. This is before we had HTTP2. And we were just loading the host domain with more and more assets. We can only download six assets at a time. But skybat.com was expected to download upwards of 40 files just to get the kind of homepage sort of built and ready. 
So we had a task, which was to move all of our critical style, uh, so all of our static assets, sorry, uh, onto a host, uh, onto a subdomain. So we moved them from this to something like this. We kind of provisioned a brand new subdomain, uh, and we loaded our assets from there so we could get greater parallelization. We patted ourselves on the back, went home, and thought we'd done a good job. Got to work the next day, and we had an automated job. Every night, web page test would run against the site, print itself out on an A3 thing, and we'd stand in the stand-up and say, look what happened. Things got worse, right? <laughs> this performance project made things worse. And we quickly soon, ident quickly soon? Wow. We soon identified the problem was this. We were heading off to a brand new domain to try and find critical assets. So the DNS, TCP, TLS negotiation for a critical asset uh, was, was slowing us down. It was slowing down the start render. We'd put network overhead in front of a critical asset. We simply moved critical assets, assets needed for first render, back onto the host domain, whose DNS, TLS, TCP was already warmed up, and things got back faster again. We left non-critical assets on the, uh, host, on the asset domain, sorry, moved everything back to the host domain. Uh, so yeah, make CS a small minify compressed load from the same host name, no DNS. This is from an article by Stoyan Stefanov. Um, I would warrant or wager, sorry, that it could be risky putting any critical assets on external domains because even though it might be domain controlled by you, it's a third party, right? You need to make sure that they're going to be on latency, no network overhead, et cetera. Well, last one, I think, I promise. Uh, last one, loading CSS and JS. This isn't anything to do with CSS in JS, right? That's another holy war for another time. But here's a little hot take, right? That um, a lot of people, I find a lot of people aren't aware of this one. Your CSS could be slowing down your JavaScript. That's because inline scripts block on CSS on construction. What that basically means is, while ever there is in-flight CSS, while ever the browser is currently downloading CSS, the browser will not execute any of your script tags. So a good example of this is um, we've got this async loading snippet. The whole point of this async snippet at the bottom is to improve performance, right? We want to asynchronously create a script tag, download the script asynchronously. But also, another performance thing we've done is we've thought, well, CSS is really important, right? It, it's on the critical path. So let's stick the CSS right at the top. The browser can download that immediately and sort of proceed with everything else. However, while the browser is downloading that CSS file, it will not start executing those script tags. And this is because the content of the script tags could modify the CSS OM. So the browser doesn't want to double up the work. It grabs the CSS, looks at it, and then runs the JavaScript, and then it'll proceed. So if we were to do this, if we have our style sheets ahead of our uh, inline sort of snippets, um, this is what we're going to get. Quite clearly, unequivocally, undeniably, we can see that that JavaScript did not start downloading until the very moment the CSS had ended. Complete synchronous loading here. Complete lack of parallelization. Simple fix here is just swap those two around, and we get this. Now, I don't know if you saw that, the load time is roughly halved. Um, I built a little service with a friend recently which generates on-purpose slow files, so that's why this is quite exaggerated. But um, simply swapping those two lines around has allowed me to, or well, those two snippets around, I guess, has allowed me to parallelize these two files. So yeah, uh, another thing, just a quick tangent. Um, those async loading snippets are a complete anti-pattern nowadays anyway. They hide things from the preload scanner. They're just not very good. So load JavaScript with the async attribute. Try and avoid those async snippets anyway. The async attribute is very well. Ignore Opera Mini. I don't even know why we've got an Opera Mini. Uh, that's really bad of me to say, but I mean, meters in the middle. Come on, give us some features. Right, I've got a minute to finish. Um, so basically, I told you it was a whirlwind tour, right? We covered quite a lot of ground there. Just to try and recap that 88 slide talk, um, basically, one, optimize your critical path. Make sure your critical path is clear of any blockages. Try and avoid external domains. Try and avoid enormous file sizes. Um, keep your blocking CSS to a minimum. So hopefully we've looked into things like uh, critical CSS and load CSS, asynchronously loading non-critical parts of the styles. Uh, avoid base64, except for a handful of incredibly small uh, known kind of edge cases. Base64 is generally an anti-pattern. Try and avoid it. Uh, import is pretty evil. Try and avoid import at all costs. It creates those long request chains. Extends is also evil um, for, for a lot of reasons other than performance. But today, my main focus is on how extends uh, doesn't really help with sort of compression. Uh, alphabetic CSS is better, but barely, and only for performance. <laughs> Don't go right in alphabetic CSS just to try and get these performance wins. And yeah, get your head straight. <laughs> Um, honestly, the simple, like the loading order, the order in which you've defined 
the content of your head tags can have a drastic impact on performance. So just experiment. But a general rule is put your inline scripts above your style sheets uh, so that those scripts can run immediately. With that, I want to say thank you very much for listening. The slides will soon be available at the bottom URL. Um, and with literally zero, I'm done. Thank you for listening. <laughs>